I'm, I'm going to say one thing about this, then I get to shut up. Uh, this drawing, this image, um, is one of the best examples I know of sort of digital DNA. Uh, we've listed six authors for this drawing, probably seven or eight or nine. It began last September, uh, over the Labor Day weekend, um, with Nicole Ratajczyk, who made the first of these renderings of this work. Material was added, changed, moved around, enlarged, reorganized. Her DNA remains inside it. Uh, added to this, Anna Longrig, Siobhan Allman, reworked the doors several times. I reworked them again. Then they became constructed by Alexander Vilku. The tower is reworked from one that I started a long time ago on the back of, Siobhan, of uh, Nicole's and it's Michael Nugent's, and uh, the wall of material behind it is, in fact, a, a whole range of authors. So, in fact, uh, virtually everybody on the team has their hand in this one drawing, which is why somehow, over and over again, I find myself making it the emblem because it has got everybody's thumbprint in it somewhere, and I can pick them all out. And that may be the last thing that I want to have to say about this. So, talking about the title, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the idea, we basically played with two titles, uh, Evidence Room or Evidence. Uh, in the end, we were offered a room uh, at, uh, at the uh, Biennale uh, Central Pavilion, and I think I pushed more for the room idea, of course, also because the Evidence Room is actually an existing institution in uh, police stations or in courthouses where evidence is kept and locked. And so this was quite important um, for, uh, for me to have a sense of a room, another room. Then, of course, we have a courtroom where the evidence was presented. So these rooms all are talking to each other. Um, yes, uh, and, and maybe at this moment, I just we have the crew here, but of course there are many people who are not here. Um, we have had incredible support out of the community. Uh, right now, the budget of this thing is close to $500,000, and we've been able to raise that money and more uh, over a uh, five months period. So, uh, and this is all volunteers who have stepped forward. And uh, so, uh, I must say that uh, uh, I was given the job to raise the funds early on, and I thought this was completely impossible. And uh, it's only because of friends and allies that we've been able to reach this point. It's a very expensive operation to get this whole exhibition out to Venice and back. Okay, I, at, uh, I should introduce myself. I'm Michael's father. <laughs> <laughs> And it's, it, it, it's a weird thing for me to be in a school where, you know, the last time we worked together might have been high school or grade 8 doing a science fair project. Uh, Michael came to me in, I'm going to say, November after talking to uh, Robert Yarn and Donald and told me a little bit about the project uh, with a lot of enthusiasm and uh, optimism. Uh, and then I, I met Donald uh, with RJ. It was the first time I met RJ uh, was in, in Hamilton, but I had met Donald several times. Uh, this was an opportunity to, uh, to give back. Um, I look at life, and sometimes a train comes by the, ch the station. You don't know where it's going, but you get on and go for the ride. Uh, it's been a hell of a ride for the last few months. Uh, I don't regret anything I've done in terms of uh, participating, volunteering, working with the team. Um, it's been a hell of a ride and it's going to keep going. Yeah, so this is early at the beginning. I just will say that, you know, there's a hell of a lot of information that needs to be conveyed about what we're going to try to do. 
a complex construction history of a death camp. And so we started out with the back, you have actually the original design uh, drawn by Donald, uh, and in the front, we have then the designs created by the SS architects. And of course, we are constantly oscillating between these two uh, drawn realities. And this is, I think, one of the very first days, the room is still very clean. And we are still very clean as we're looking at these, at these drawings that were made actually around 15 years ago by a, a Waterloo student named Mikhail Katlipovsky who redrew uh, many of the, uh, the, the original drawings uh, of the Auschwitz crematoria because they were too grainy, they were too gray to be pub published in my original book on Auschwitz. So we, uh, I asked him over a term to redo these things. And, uh, so we also use some of these for this project. I mean, I can say a few things about uh, casting. You see Anna, Anna and Anna uh, casting uh, the first experiments. And I, one of the reasons why uh, I was invited to the team was uh, because Donald and Robert Young knew that I was interested in casting, both historically and theoretically. And to apply this to this project, um, I mean, I think it was a, a good decision. A bit, like, you know, in the end, there's something about casting that has to do with the trace, uh, and also with evidence. And you, know, you mentioned that on the interview as well. Like you know, you just you press something, I guess, fingerprints, and then you have it. So there's a notion that there's a, a tie to the tangible reality of it. And I think there's another dimension of casting, which is because of that, because you feel like it always comes from a contact. That if you look at a cast, you can sort of question it and try to understand. So when was that contact? And so there's maybe part of this empathy there, where one has to be willing to engage with the cast and try to understand where that, you know, where that uh, was from. Uh, I think um, so. In, in to some extent, like there's a kind of relationship to a certain truth possibly with casting, but we, as we will see, and then through these images, and even the fact that Robert Young pointed that actually one drawing had to be redrawn. There's also a certain level of translation from these originals, and then so that also gets uh, more complex than that. I think the other dimension of casting is the the relationship between uh, presence and absence. You know, the cast basically have a mold, and you cast into it. So you always draw the negative, and then you fill it. So there's always it's already two things, so two times possibly: the time of the contact, the time of the cast, the time of the first evidence, the time at which we're revisiting them today. Um, and also presence and absence, life lives and life lost. I think there's a lot in the casting uh, that is really, um, I mean, loaded, but also in some ways appropriate to this project. And I, we'll get back to it. And I know you'll talk about the process that Trump, uh, it was a process of learning as well. <laughs> and that's <super> <laughs> It looks a little intense. Uh, this is a picture of the first door that was uh, constructed slightly oversized. And what I'm doing in this in this image is actually dimensioning the door. I've got a you can see there's a square on the the lower left or the lower left side of the photo. But getting the door ready to dimension to size um, based on the dimension that you'll see later in the presentation of 205 and 100. So this is uh, a, a picture drawn by a court uh, artist, courtroom artist, or, uh, a, a done in uh, April 2000 when uh, the judge, uh, Lord Grey, gave the judgment uh, in the Irving Lipstadt case. You see Lipstadt in the middle, and Irving to the right, the libel case in which Holocaust denier. Uh, Irving sued American historian uh, Lipstadt for libel and. Uh, this is, he just arrives at the court and he had uh, uh, protesters through eggs over him. So this is why he is not wearing his jacket. Uh, in any case, uh, we want this case very big and one of the key issues in the trial was actually the evidence about Auschwitz because Irving was a historian who had converted to Holocaust denial on the basis of a uh, forensic report on Auschwitz. And so these are, there are many headlines the next day, but in the, this is the 17th, uh, sorry, the 12th of April, but Auschwitz was very central in this case, also emotionally became uh, the center point of the case, because when you deny the Holocaust in general, it's abstract, but Auschwitz is not. So I wrote this book 
Uh, it was published in 2002, and it's around 550 pages long. Uh, indeed, it's quite a densely written book. And, um, and I thought when I wrote the book, that's the last of it. I mean, maybe I'll have some more lectures, but uh, this book will stand as my record of, of, of my involvement uh, and the, about the record of the evidence we have, mainly architectural, for the uh, uh, genocidal use of the Auschwitz crematorium. And, uh, and so then that has an unexpected uh, uh, kind of follow-up when in this room in 2007, Alejandro Aravena comes to give a lecture to the school. Afterwards, I have dinner with him, and I give him a copy of this book. And he writes a very nice email. And then again, I don't hear anymore for seven, more seven years, seven years and three months. And then on the 28th of July, 2015, I get an email from him that he's just been appointed director of the Biennale and that he would like this material to be in the central pavilion which is not, in fact, uh, with the national pavilions, and there's a can Canadian competition to get into the Canada pavilion, and then you have this, this international exhibition. And Aravena is very famous for his work um, with the bottom 50% of the world. So he is, uh, he is, he is very much concerned about the, the state of, of, of the quality of life in the favelas, in the slums, and so on. And he wants to basically bring an approach to architecture that includes that kind of architecture, but also other battles. And he saw that what had happened in the courtroom in London was a battle that centered on architecture, this gave forensic evidence. And uh, he wanted that in the international exhibition and also the forensic evidence that was studied by A.L. Weizmann, and he talked about that in an other empathy uh, uh, presentation. Uh, half a year ago. So, which brings me then to my colleagues. I mean, my problem is I've written the book, but it's not an exhibition. I cannot sit in that room and just read aloud from the book, so we need to find another way to present it. So, I go to Donald first, and I say, Donald, how do we do this? Should I talk? Yes. Uh, well, um, in, in every successful museum, or, uh, or in fact, exposition, um, the, the sense is there are several layers. There's the doorway, which lets you know whether you're interested or not, and there's the three-minute circuit, and then there's the capacity to maybe say, this is interesting, I'm going to stick with some of this a lot longer, or a lot longer again, or a lot longer again. Uh, Robert's 550 pages uh, are the tail end of a lot longer again. After that, you don't have to do any more. Um, what happens in an exposition is people will pass through this room, and it's a room en voila. We'll show you the plan. It's a very funny and stylized plan. But everyone will pass through this room. And the question is, will they pass through it? Will they pass through it and slow down? Will they pass through it and stop? Will they pass through it and make a circuit? Every one of those is going to be, in some sense, a different experience. But the first experience we have to have in some sense, it is in the first very few moments of just sitting there, walking into this room and going, something else is happening here. And it's probably something I might look at, and it's definitely not something jolly. Um, and those become our opening questions. Uh, and the exhibition is effectively a translation of the book, but it's a translation of the book in space and in surface and in colors and things and it changes completely at that point. Of course, there's the other question, which is, um, how in the world do you work on this stuff for months without it messing you up? Because uh, honestly, it kind of can when you actually have to work your way through design. And I think a lot of what's going on after this is people doing very <coughs> honest work about really awful things. Like, you have to concentrate on them, to focus on them, to work them out, to have to get inside. The minds, on one hand, of often the slave laborers who make these things uh, under really appalling circumstances. They're not paid, they're not fed, they're, they're, they make these things. Um, and these things are designed by Nazi asshats, the worst creeps in the world, 
to murder other people. And at the same time, you have to make them into an exhibition that people can see and understand in a few moments. That is to say, we can't make a horror show. We have to actually figure out how to tell that story. And everyone, I think, in this team has worked on that problem for months and months now. And it, it's inevitably a very difficult problem. And of course, it begins with the evidence we've got, pictures and plans and testimonies. Yeah, so this, these are two images. This is an image of gas hatches. These were basically um, 30 by 40 centimeter large um, uh, openings that would be closed to these gas hatches doors that uh, were photographed by Omar Bell, who was here a few weeks ago uh, as part of the lecture series. He was then my assistant in Auschwitz. We found this in a basically uh, a little room at the back of a crematorium full of garbage. But these are pieces of evidence that were brought in there. And so, um, and, and the reason this was important in the trial was that uh, we have all kind of convergent evidence about the function of these things. We have a letter that says uh, we need to order gas type hatches uh, 30 by 40 centimeters. These are 30 by 40 centimeters. We have a blueprint that shows the 30 by 40 centimeters uh, at, uh, just below the eave of the gas chambers. Uh, and we have eyewitness evidence talking about the SS climbing on a ladder to open these things to throw the poison crystals into those rooms. So it's all about convergent evidence. None of these things by itself says anything, but they say something together. Well, now, I just want to say one thing before we continue. These photos have been made by Fred. Uh, all the photos of the cast, and you know, I'm seeing for the first time at this scale, and I'm in awe, Fred. I just want to tell you, it's an absolutely magnificent. One for the team. I mean, I can say, well, I think others will talk about the cast, but I mean, this is one of the translation. I think, I mean, one aspect when we talk about the notion that when you cast, like you get the physical presence and it's situated and it's tangible, but it's a bit of a lie, right? Because we're casting photographs. They're, you know, they're flat, and if you indeed cast them, then you just get a blank slate. So a lot of the work was uh, spent trying to understand how you can then, uh, in some ways, translate this to a surface. And uh, you know, all of this is really skin deep, ultimately. It's really trying to articulate this in a surface, and I'm talking about it, but really, you know, this is the work that, I mean, you'll touch on that later. Sure. I didn't mean to change. No, please, okay. because we'll get back to it. Um, I, I'm going to talk about this for a sec, and then everybody will talk about it. Um, Robert, Robert and Miriam's wife took me to lunch at probably the end of July or the beginning of August and said, how about it, and what will it cost? And I think I, I, after a couple of minutes, we talked about evidence. And a couple more minutes, we said, I think it should all be white. And a little while after that, I said, it should all be plastered, and there should be architectural monuments uh, of some sort. And I think we almost started calling the monuments then. I understood two of these things. I understood the gas-tight door, and I understood the gas-tight hatch, and I did not understand the gas column, the third piece, for the longest time. I, and I think it's like block, block. It's like the other two are architectonic elements I understand. This is one. I simply didn't ever understand until much later in its history. Um, but that, that if we had no money, that would be the exhibition. <laughs> and the minus the plasters. The moment we have the plasters, we have to have something to hold them up, which gets to be called the matrix, because the matrix is in fact something that's entirely neutral to the content of it. And if we want it to be a room, it needs a ceiling. And so that, that's the end of the design. After that, everything is development. Um, and it's and brilliant to the observation to make this thing a one-way system rather than the two-way system so that the elements of shelves full of plaster exhibits are on two walls instead of four. But you now begin to get a sense of the, sort of the shape of the room, which is you know, we're trapped right in the middle of this giant exposition system. So this photo is key in the, in the history of, uh, of the trial. 
because this is a photo before the, the, the crematorium tomb is completed, and you see the gas chamber there before actually it was covered with dirt. And what is very important here is that you actually see the top of the gas columns sticking out. We don't have any other photo. And what's also important is that we can date this photo because of the little bit of soot that's on the top of the chimney, which means it was taken after the first trial run of the ovens. And the dating of this photo became very important in the trial because Irving was arguing that what's on top of that gas chamber were not these tops of the gas columns, but basically um, vessels with tar to tar the roof. But we already, we simply could date this drawing, they hadn't yet started tarring the roof. So uh, these are the kind of arguments we, we had to deal with in the trial. So probably the most important photo we have of the, of the extermination installation inside the most lethal of crematoria. And this, in this crematorium, probably around a half a million people were killed in that one room. Yeah, so it's the most lethal place on earth. Well, these are just moments of the... Uh, so the large photograph is then part of the exhibit, so it's something that's put on the shelf. But then also to try to draw attention to something which is such a small piece of it, then we try to zoom into this, to this moment, and it gets blown up, and you just... You know, even at the, the different tests, in the end we pick more this approach because we could start to even pick out, if you know where to look, you can see the top of these columns uh, as they emerge out from the roof before that was put on. But these are some of the tests that you know, took us a month to do where Robin was thinking, are these final yet? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, Patience has never been one of my virtues. <laughs> uh, one of the big problems also is that the, the, the chimney disappeared from one of the casts and all the smoke, of course, coming from the locomotives chimney, which of course in some ways kind of interesting, but the smoke which is there is not the smoke from the, from the crematorium. But um, I think this was probably one of the most difficult things to, to cast and to get it right. This is Siobhan's yes. story. Um, hello, I'm Siobhan, if you don't know me. Um, so for the past few months, uh, I've been primarily working on um, the molds for the casts. Um, so we've been casting photos, uh, plans, and sketches, and I thought it'd be kind of cool if um, I ran you through how we process um, these photos. So, um, Don, do you want to, like, I guess the image that was just there was um, like a scan of a... Should I go back? No, no, it's... I mean, it's yeah. Fine. Um, I go back. <laughs> uh, it's a scan of... Um, of um, the original photos of the architects of Auschwitz. Um, so we spent the first month uh, testing um, how we turn this 2D object into like a 3D uh, like tactile cast. So we exper experimented with um, a lot of things. Uh, we were considering milling at one point, so we were using Grasshopper um, and the image of Sampler to make a 3D model that we can roll in the CNC. Um, and then in the end, we decided to use the laser cutter and uh, raster engrave um, just because there's so much detail in these photos and it offered um, an opportunity to capture that. Um, so from there, previously we saw there was a lot of experiments with the raster cutting. Um, okay, so next image. So bring that image and um, put this into Photoshop. And then you have about an hour to two hours um, making the photo um, kind of into good shape. Um, so after you kind of play with the adjustment layers, you posterize it, um, which makes it, uh, because it's black and white, into kind of four layers. So there's a black, a white, and then um, two grays, so like a lighter, lighter gray and a darker gray. Um, and then you export this. So this is this was exported at 600 dpi, um, and the size of the cast is uh, 590 by 900 mil. Um, okay, next image. So then um, you bring this into AutoCAD, um, the image, um, to raster. Um, so uh, the black that was in the previous image would be the deepest cut. Um, and the white would be un, like not cut at all, and then the 
laser would then understand um, to adopt the power for the in between gray scales. Um, so here, what you're seeing is actually the translucent acrylic. Yes, yeah, so this is cut onto a uh, quarter inch acrylic. Um, okay, so then, yeah, um, it's uh, taped to an MDF base to make it flat, um, and then it's given to the Anas. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like, um, you know, put mold release and like work witchcraft and all these things to make it um, be able to release properly, and then the cast comes out and it's wonderful. So, I mean, the work that Shivana she's been describing for the graph is actually. Then it's slightly different from drawings, and this is a drawing. That, I mean, luckily, this is a drawing that had been redrawn, so we could go from hard lines, which made it easier to then uh, translate into a file that could be easily cut. Uh, and so this is that drawing rendered. But I mean, all of this. I mean, in the end, I think one of the difficulties, if you, th if you talk about, um, on the one hand, trying to work on this, uh, where people have done very terrible things, I think. I think the, the other difficulty that I found is that on the one hand you try to exhibit and you try to produce good cast and then the difficulty is to make sure that we don't aestheticize, aestheticize it. You, you know, you don't, it, you want to present it, but we don't want to get wrapped up into making this beautiful. It's like there's nothing really beautiful about it. So it's really, I think, always this tension in trying to understand abstracting it enough so that it, it, there's a distance, but um, making it tangible enough so that we can, in some ways, uh, the engaged in it. Can I just also address one you want thing? To back that one? No, you no, we can this one too. Yeah, you can. Uh, this, this is, by the way, a sketch of the fir first man uh, who escaped Auschwitz, Woody uh, Burma, who in '44 gives a report on, on what's happening there. He makes this drawing of what he thinks the crematorium is. He's not been in the crematorium. One thing, of course, we have to deal with these are quite fragile things or so. Uh, and we're going to be in a very high traffic environment. Uh, last year, there were two, two years ago, 250,000 people went through the exhibition. Another in, piece is in that. In two months. In two months, yeah. Now we've got six. Yeah. The other, another thing, of course, is that this might attract violence. Uh, that this is not an exhibition that everyone will like. And that new Nazis might target. So. You know, there is the, the things themselves are fragile, and uh, and I think the whole concept is is exposed. So we don't know what's going on. This is a very important drawing. Uh, it's a tiny little sketch by a 15-year-old boy who actually saw the gas columns in the gas chamber, and he drew it immediately after the war in Mauthausen when he was liberated and. Uh, there's a long story how he got into the gas chamber when it was empty in the middle of the winter too warm. But this is one of the pieces of evidence we have about the gas cones. It's the only there are only a couple of drawings made immediately after the war by survivors. Of course, uh, the gas columns were seen by 500,000 people, and those 500,000 people who saw the gas columns, or maybe 700, did they take crematorium 3 into account. Only maybe 40 lived to tell, to tell what they've seen. Uh, so these are very charged, uh, very charged documents also. Also confessions, these are the confessions by um, the Commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hiss, who after the war wrote his memoirs. Oops, sorry. A section through the gas chamber, what becomes the gas chamber, with the ventilation channels you see above and below. The scene of killings at a fire pit as remembered in 45 or 46 by a survivor named David Olea, who was one of the slave workers in the crematorium. Another drawing by Olea. The gas hatches. Where a piece, very central piece of evidence, for example, is the fact that uh, we can trace uh, the way the doors are hung. This is a morgue that becomes a gas chamber. And the change, uh, the made, one of the major changes in adapting this space from a morgue into a gas chamber is that the doors have originally opened 
inwards, now open outwards after the transformation. Because This, uh, these drawings are here because they're part of a process. But, um, a, one version of the tower, the far one, is 97.5% Michael Nugent. The one closer to me is sort of 97.5% Donald Mackay. Michael Nugent Tower is not exactly what's built, but it's very close. Is that right? The door is, we, we went through a design process where everyone would, not everyone, but several people, would take the same drawings or the same images and the same dimensions and they would do their particular digital drawing of that. We would lay them all on top, see how closely we agreed, because we're interpreting a sh shaggy material. And then finally I would just, take the chance of sitting to say if there's a mistake to be made it'll be me so I would produce the final version. So this drawing of the door for instance is a compilation of data from several different doors uh, because there is no single intact door. There's no door with a frame. There's a door in a museum in Auschwitz but it's not intact and we have no idea what the frame is and all of the hardware isn't there. We have others, some of them may be faked, we don't know. Um, so at some point, this is how we actually had to work out this stuff speculatively, and then of course we get to work it out in the shop. So this was my interpretation of how to build that. It's not what was finally built. I think if you don't want to go on that. Um, oh, this one? Go back to Go back to the other one for a moment. So this was Donald's first drawing. Uh, actually, I think this was your second drawing of the column. 
And uh, as you said, you, you kind of struggled with it. I think we all struggled with it. And the gas gun was a weird object because it was the only piece in here that there was no evidence of. I mean, the only issue with the Holocaust denial was no holes, no Holocaust. The holes being the holes in the roof of the gas chambers, which the gas columns actually came out of. All of the columns were destroyed. There was no drawings. There was no evidence. The sketch that's on the next page I did about an hour ago, which was sort of my interpretation of what a fabricator, what we as fabricators really needed, which is this. And when we were building the gas column, there's an understanding that we're not working as designers. And I think that's something that Donald struggled with a lot is that, and I think everybody here, is that we're constantly designing, we're drawing, we're thinking about how something goes together, but you're not actually doing it. And when we were building the gas column, we weren't being designers, we were being fabricators. We're laying pieces of steel down on the floor and we're saying, do these things fit? Does this work? Oh, I can't fit a bolt in here because this isn't the way. And so everything that we did uh, grew out of the process of making it. We didn't sit back and consider something. We never looked at the aesthetics of it. We just said, this is how this needs to work. And I think everything that we've done is an interpretation of that. Uh, the gas column is probably the most, uh, the most open because there is no evidence this was a recreation. This was something that we built as fabricators the way it would have been built uh, by slave laborers, by men whose names have been taken and replaced with numbers. And this is what we came up with. And this is Bob Bentini, who is not here tonight, but who's the ghost in the machine in this game. So, uh, Bob is my best friend. When I was on my 3B work term, I'm going to say last century, <laughs> I met Bob. He looked like that, but with a mustache. And we've been friends ever since. Uh, I've worked with his son, Kevin, mentoring him. He's worked with Michael, mentoring him. And... Uh, uh, in terms of having no vested interest in the project other than friendship, uh, he got on the train and, and came for the ride, and uh, without Bob, uh, none of the metal work could have been done. I just would like to say something that uh, I, I told about the tremendous success we had in fundraising. Now that success only came very late. Uh, so. Donald and Sasha Hastings and I, uh, Sasha Hastings is not here tonight, an independent uh, art producer, we had set a date of the 15th of November as a cut of date. If we didn't have the funds to do it, we would cancel the project. And basically, Michael and Tom and Bob came in just at that time and volunteered to make the gas call. Just said, we're going to do this. And... Uh, so it was here, you know, we were in, 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 in Hamilton, in Bob's, uh, in Bob's factory, a uh, stamping plant. And, you know, when somebody comes to you with that kind of gift, you know, just, they volunteered this. There was no going back, so I came home and I told Miriam, I said, you know, there's three guys in Hamilton, we call them the Hamilton Steel Boys. So, uh, they have offered to make the gas call, and Miriam said, okay, uh, we're going to Venice now. Yeah, we have an exhibition. So, and it was that moment that turned actually the story around. And, and, and after that, we were resolved to go. And then finally, donors came in. So it, it was literally, you know, uh, uh, thank you. You made it happen. Now, th this is where I get to come in with, with, with one other story, the structure of all of this. Um, Robert came to me. And then after a week of his making suggestions, I had bought him a sandwich in the park, and we had a discussion about who's the captain and who was the pilot, and that was a good discussion. And later on, we changed that format, and it's been the most useful one since. Um, there are four principles, but really everybody's involved in it, but the four principles are the people who are most likely to make the mistakes because they're the people who are making the decisions in um, circumstances where all variables aren't known but they have to make it anyway. Um, the four principles found themselves neatly divided into upstream and downstream. And I think the upstream and downstream part of this has actually been one of the things that has kept us sane. Um, upstream, if it was a movie, you'd say they were the producers. Downstream, you'd say the directors. Um, 
But in this case, it's a little more complicated. Upstream are diplomats, they're fundraisers who get the other people to show up on demand for, to perform if they need it. Um, they are, um, Robert has been the diplomat at this end of the world. Sasha Hastings has been our diplomat in Italy, which is her forte. She's also been our editor, and we produced a book, which is um, more or less in the publisher's lap at this moment, designed by Lou Charles, um, the graduate program, who's not here tonight, and who's one of those sort of dear friends of this project. But the division between upstream and downstream means that at any one time, none of us are completely crazy. So if Robert was in despair all fall, I was just drawing and didn't give a damn. It was his, money was his problem. My problem was to figure out how to do something. And I'm, I have to say that once he got the money, I can only quote Donald Schmidt, who said, you know, there's that moment when you come back to the office and say, great, we got the job. Shit, we got the job. <laughs> um, once the money showed up, Robert was happier, and I was. Yeah, no, I, I, I just have to add one more sentence to this <laughs> that basically my mental state over the past six months was how much I was behind Donald's spending. Then I think uh, three weeks ago, I pulled the hat of Donald's spending, and the night, that same night, the budget increased uh, 30%. So <laughs> I was behind again. But yeah. I had that one night. I had that one night, yes. But uh, I, I'm again, I'm once again, I'm ahead, I think. Still. You, you, are, you are ahead, yeah. but the fact that I'm extravagant. I, I'm also going to say this <laughs> upstream and downstream is. There's no free labor on this, and we have, I think we will have paid everybody full wage for everything we've done. I made this speech to do the other day. When I was a young architect, I realized one day, because somebody left the billing information in the photocopier, it was that long ago, um, and I realized that in an office where I wasn't getting paid overtime, in a large office, an office of about 40 people, uh, my billing was the second highest billing in the office behind the principal. And uh, I thought that can never be right. That, you know, you, one gets paid for one's work in this world. Uh, so that has been Robert and uh, Sasha. And Sasha has been instrumental in helping to raise this money. She's been brilliant. Um, but Robert and Sasha have never for a moment uh, looked at Anne or I and said, well, well, can't you get them to volunteer to do some more? Um, because that would be basically inappropriate. Uh, so the upstream-downstream rule has been important. What's great about Bob Bintini is that he's an upstream fine, but a downstream guy. So this is Bob, and we owe him a lot. That, that commercial over. I think those are Tom's hands in that picture. Uh, if there's nine fingers, it's Bob. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It might be. It's Bob. It's Bob. Sorry. Yes. Uh, so that's forging of uh, hand forging of, of the basket. Got it. Um, so I'm Alex. This is Brad, and together we worked on the woodworking for the doors and the hatch. Um, just to echo Michael's discussion about the gas pump, I think the same attitude was adopted in the creation of. These monuments that represent the front, the rear of a gas hatch, of a gas door, and a gas hatch. So we started off with an annotation uh, that read 100 over 205, so 100 wide, 205 tall. And then, can you go for the next one? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so that provided like a framework for the rest of the construction, but then the finer details were basically given to us by these two images. So this is the prisoner side of the door, and this is the Nazi side of the door. The detail of the prisoner side. That's Brad harvesting wood. So this image is from a barn that is uh, about 21 kilometers east of Cambridge. Uh, it was the Lapsley Farm, Lot 21, Concession 8, former North Beverly Township. 
and it was the, the source of the material that we used not only for the dimensional lumber, but also for the, the plank that we used on the door. Uh, part of our aspiration in selecting a material was to try to find a material that we didn't have to do anything to, and that aligned somewhat with the condition of a gas door that had been in use. Um, many of the conversations that Brad and I have had in the shop was how was this built at the time in that particular situation. So um, this, this is a photo of an example where we resorted to a tool that's fairly primitive. This is a, a hand forged draw knife, uh, pre-Confederate. And we used this to shape the rungs of a, of a ladder that was used by, by, by the SS to throw Zyklon V into a gas chamber. So what was interesting was that we had to put ourselves in, in the position of the carpenters at the time, which, which then brings the forensic discussion uh, back to methods and processes of building. And our approach to the, to the construction was to take, to take both uh, dynamics in that we could use a primitive tool when we, when we needed a primitive tool, but if there was a, a situation where we needed a contemporary tool, we did that. Uh, the tool that I'm using there and the tool that I've had have in my hand is a tenoner, and the tenoner is used to, to do a tenon into the side grain of the material and then uh, a companion tenon into the other, uh, the corresponding material, and then to the other forms the frame. And we used materials, or we used, we used machinery like this when we wanted to create a condition that looked like the original condition, but actually outperformed the, the, the original condition in that it was, a, it was a design and it was a joint that was robust and would stand up to what was going to be required for the exhibition. So, um, I guess like the last interesting thing that we want to talk about was, was that given like the evidence, but also the lack of evidence, um, we, in particular to the, to the doors, we only really had half of the information because we didn't have a photograph of the actual jam condition. So if we looked at the photograph of the prisoner side of the door, we could see along the edge a kind of a jam condition that represented the negative of the actual jam. And so Brad and I had to use, in this situation, a mock-up to, to build the jam so we could figure out how it works. And um, I guess the, the three things that, that we kind of learned from doing the woodworking was that a lot of the evidence that, that we used wasn't actually seen in a photograph. Um, time, for example, with respect to the selection of the wood, um, the process with, with respect to the, the tools that we used, and the function of the doors with respect to like, our um, knowledge of architecture. So. This is just an inside view of the same shot. The plywood core represents the, the uh, width of the jam that would be in the, the masonry wall. And the step condition that we see, this piece here and the, the companion piece, uh, represents the weather seal condition. And as Alex said, constructing, constructing everything meant looking at what was there as well as looking at what wasn't there. And that particular assembly as a prototype provided if you look at the very top of the image, you see, you see some end grain. It provided the, the width of the jam condition on the, on the guard side, and it showed a corresponding condition on the opposite, and that was considerably wider. So that if you see the samples before we go, uh, you'll notice that there's a different condition from left to right and from back to front. Sorry. This, these were taken this afternoon. Uh, at a site inspection, that's where those doors go. Um, these things are huge. Um, part of this whole enterprise has been that the people have been crafting things individually. They go into things which are manufactured elsewhere. This is one of the things that's manufactured elsewhere. We chose these people to manufacture them because they can make a light version of this. They told me today it would take six people to lift it. So, so much for light. Um, but that's, that's kind of our adventure. This, and I'm, I'm not belaboring this part because it's, it's, it's of interest to me and it, it, it has to work. 
Um, all of this stuff fits inside um, a sort of scaffold of uh, really the lightest material that I can work out. And this is it, now beginning to be packed up, uh, ready to ship. Um, and the ready to ship part is the, is the great story. That is the plan, insofar as I believe that the floor is actually gray and the shelves and the exhibits are white. Um, so it's, it's, it's a plan you can arrive at in an hour. Um, the detail of it all takes weeks to sort out. And uh, I think that's what's been one of the most interesting parts of the whole problem. <coughs> this is the other interesting part of the whole problem. Do you want to speak to this? Sure. Sure. I I'm going to introduce you to so say, January 5th was the first meeting that we all had together as a, as a whole team. And in that meeting, I said one thing, which was that the most important part of this problem was the logistics. It had cost $175,000 to build this thing in Canada. It was going to cost way over twice that to put it up in Venice, and we had to figure out how to do it. We didn't have enough time because we only had a project that I projected at five and a half months was going to be compressed into less than three. Uh, so logistics were everything. Uh, so I took the smartest person in the room and said, they're your problem. Uh, and that, that was quite perfect. So. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Don, a few slides ago, talked about uh, the the photos this afternoon about being a, being a lot heavier. That's the kind of thing that makes me panic. Uh, so doing logistics, um, like I mean, oh, I have two slides, and, and I guess they're at the end of the presentation right now because realistically this is where we are now as we're finishing up the actual artifacts and monuments, is figuring out how to get it there, how to set it up, how to keep the boxes, keep the crates so that we can bring it back to Canada, and how we can do that without any issues. Um, so that's, that's mainly been what I've been working on, but what you can see here is kind of uh, my own architectural sensibilities coming into how we create these things, which is modeling them and actually trying to understand volumetrically how they're going to fit in, stack together, um, and become kind of these crates and boxes so that we can get it there easily. Um, so it was, this is kind of the third round or fourth round of going through these crates to make sure it's going to work, but... Just this afternoon, we've got a mass shipment of materials from Uline in order to actually start creating these objects, and, and that's where we are now. But one of the most important things about the project is how, in a way, the, 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 the objects are so fragile and so precious um, in, in many ways, and so packing them is very important because the exhibition is itself as a whole, uh, so we don't want to lose anything or have any broken casts. Uh, so it's going to take us about a week and a half to pack them all, as a team together, uh, and then get it there and just pray that nowhere in the lagoon or any of these boxes is going to drop off the back of a boat as we're trying to get it to Venice. So, yeah. One thing to add to that, it, it, I mean, it's like flybys at the plant where these things are all, like all of the stuff that we're not making is getting made, are like two or three times a week now, and it's, it's a little anxiety inducing, but they have now been given these from Piper, and they were producing their own because they're actually creating all the stuff. Mm -hmm. And when I said, I think the people who are going to unpack this should be here when you pack them, the engineer who's running the things in, in his Russian accent, that's brilliant, absolutely per perfect. They must come, they must come. So they're buggered, we gotta go. Um, but it's also a, an incredible technology. I mean, every time I inspect this stuff, I inspect it in the huge chamber where everything's packed and shipped. And it's, it's a spectacle of, of a kind of strange architectural quality, which things are cocooned and they vanish. Mm -hmm. And of um, course, the handicaps of shipping to Venice are you know, tremendous. I mean, we started out with Sasha Hastings. One of the reasons she got involved is that she actually helped in the making of, so I think, three Canada Pavilion exhibitions. Uh, and uh, the story she started out with, it cost A to get everything from Toronto to Venice Airport, and it cost as much to get from the airport in Venice to the Biennale site. Uh, and so this I has cut that in half, yeah. mm -hmm. huh? by the way. Yeah, so this has been an incredible match there. And I think that the other piece of, of Piper's job, which is not visible here, 
is that she's been, I think, for two and a half months or three months now on the telephone daily with shippers trying to actually solve this problem. Uh, also, paperwork is very difficult because it's a work of art. It needs to be imported in the EU. We had a fallback solution that we would basically throw the whole thing in the lagoon after the um, after the uh, denial was over, we can be imprisoned for that, I understand, in Italy if we do so. Yeah, find any so, prison, yeah. The amount of paperwork that negotiating with the Italians is, is, is a nightmare, but I think Piper, you know, the invisible part of your job, which is not in drawing, is actually negotiating this on a daily basis. We just have to hope it all goes through, right? My, you know, my part of this doesn't actually show up until everything is in that room when we get to Venice and we're sure that it's there, so. When, it, when it's like this. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I can say is, I haven't had a reasonable night's sleep for six weeks. <laughs> this is really scary some days. Every time you look at a thing and say, okay, that door is a six man job to move it. And I think, okay, so there's, there's only four people on the team there, we'll go hire two Italian. <laughs> and that's sort, of, that's sort of the narrative of it all. And that's the show. I think it took longer than we planned. Anybody want to ask any of us any questions? I think you deserve a round of applause.